up hello guys today we're going to go through how to do your methodology in your a level nea and how to get full marks in the nea let's go so this is the same disclaimer i've used in the past few videos ignore the word count write more essentially you're never going to get full marks without writing more than 4k and yeah you need to bend the raw slightly so let's go to the next one so before we get into the methodology and how to make a note of this checklist as this is the checklist I use personally to get full marks. And as long as you tick, up, tick off all of these, you should be able to be in the top band of marks. And even if you don't get full marks in this section, you'll be up there with like 90, 85%. All right, so how to structure your methodology is very simple. So the first thing you want to do is obviously explain all your methods and how to do it, what you need in it. So as you can see where my cursor is, so I separated it in by explaining all my interviews and my assessments first. So my EQA and my resident interviews. And then step two, I did all the extras such as the uh, overall evaluation, ethics and the risk assessment. And yeah, you just step two is the part where you want to make your work elevated to the next level. All right, so another keynote is methodology is the easiest section, but it's very easy to lose marks. Uh, I think it's for most any exam boards it's the one the methodology counts towards the least of marks so it has the least marks so if i were you i wouldn't stress them too much on this section but if you have time you can spice it up with some ways so i'll show you how to make your methodology stand out more and yeah just make sure to follow all the full steps as this is a brain dead section you don't need to think essentially all right so step one the easiest part uh you just have to do the bare minimum really so as you can see on the right I've given you an example of my one, so I've done an EQA, and yeah, so the bare minimum includes the equipment, time, date, and season that you've um, for your method, and then number two is procedure. So you need to st outline step by step how to do your assessment or whatever your interview. Number three, your justification, why your method is valid, and evaluation. So within this little part, you need to evaluate slightly if you want to get top marks. All right, so just to make sure everything's clear again. So equipment, date, season, very self-explanatory. Fill in the gaps, please. So if I give, I'm zoomed in on my uh, EQA. And yeah, it's literally just listing out what time, what you need, literally. Think about what you need exactly, a pen, a trundle wheel, anything, date and season. So I did mine 6th of October, so basically a year ago now. And yeah, don't worry about exact timings. I mostly made it up. As, in, as long as you're within that time range, it should be fine. And yeah, uh, another small thing I would say is you can add an appendix, which is optional, but adds to the feelings of a real research paper. So uh, if you look here where my cursor is, um, this is what I put in my appendix. And notice in uh, the top part, I said refer to table 8.1 in the appendix. And yeah, appendix is usually used to like show what, your, what recording sheets you used, what it looked like and yeah so as you can see here on the bottom this is the recording sheet i actually used and i just put it in and again would i recommend doing this yes if you have enough time but if you don't have enough time don't worry about it this is just the little stuff that makes you look cooler look better but yeah let's move on to the next part so the procedure so as i said procedure is very simple but as i said before methodology is a section where you can forget a lot of easy stuff so procedure essentially just means talk about the type, uh, not talk, just talk about what you did, okay? But within this, I want you guys to talk about the type of sampling you use. Use exact measurements when you take sample points. So I noticed in number number one, I said stratified sampling, which ensured that I type. Uh, so I talked about the type of sampling. So I used stratified on number one, bullet point number one, and I showed the exact location on Church Street and High Street. Number two, I used systematic sampling again. I talked about the sampling I used and I talked about exact measurements. So I walked for 450 meters and I took a sample every 50 meters. So I just made sure it was very clear on how many, how many sample points I'm taking. So yeah. And I said starting at zero meters. So I would have 10 sample points at the end. And um, number three, if you read once at a sample point, rank each factor. So I'm just being very exact and meticulous about everything. Yeah, as a final third bullet point, just be super specific and meticulous. Imagine you're explaining something to a five-year-old, yeah, who and enjoys Prime and Fortnite, and just you gotta make sure it's absolutely clear because the examiner, 
is going to walk in. Just imagine you're an idiot that knows nothing about you or just idiots, okay? So you all talk as if you're talking to some idiot. And yeah, you just talk about repetitions as well. All right, so within the justification, you just want to explain why your method is valid and how it will aid the investigation. So if you look on my example from my NEA as well, so I argued that asking locals gives more qualitative data. And uh, yeah, I linked it to my other thing, other uh, methods. I talked about why my environmental quality survey is often, it gives a lot more quantitative data. And yeah, I wanted more qualitative data. And yeah, I always talked about the lived experiences. In your case, it would probably be a different factor, but you need to justify why. And a very easy way is to talk about, again, if you look down here where my class is, key talking points, talk about the type of data you'll get from your method, quantitative or qualitative. Uh, yeah, and how each data type helps. So um, if you're too lazy, quantitative data, is often hard data and less subjective which obviously is a it's a benefit but you can argue the other way around as well so qualitative data is better because it's more subjective and it's a more accurate representation you can argue both ways but this is what you need to keep on doing and yeah you just need to talk about how your method will achieve your goals and in my case if you look at bullet point number two i talked about how local asking locals will give qualitative data and they have more experience in, in identifying key trends than obviously a interviewer who's only been there for a day oh sorry all right and within your small section so you want to do a small evaluation which is optional for now but i feel like it, if you have time you should definitely do this within the first part of explaining your entire method so evaluation you just want to talk about the key advantages and disadvantages of the method mention time population and main occupation type and how your method may be flawed and key tip is that evaluation is not always negative. You can explain why your method is suitable. So a lot of people fall into the trap of just saying, oh, it's such a bad method. But what you're showing to the examiner is if you if you explain why your method is so bad, then why are you putting it in there? So you've got to make sure you have a balance of why it's good and why it's bad. And uh, risk section can be very short. As I said, it's optional for now because at the end, I'll make you do an overall evaluation of methods. So if you just read through this method, so I talked about a key disadvantage was the qualitative data and the subjectiveness. And also talked about the uh, method was performed at 1 p.m. on a Thursday or October 6th, which means that uh, the more youthful populations were still in school, could not be excluded. And data may not be uh, completely reliable. And yeah, although this one is not a best example, I've, I fell in the trap here. As you can see, this is a half decent example because I just mentioned everything that was negative. But yeah, just gonna make sure you have a balance of why it's good and why it's bad. It's not like this one. All right, so within this, after you do explain every single one of your methods, as I showed here, so I explained my EQA, resident interviews, and non-participant observation. I want you to talk about an overall evaluation of your methods. So uh, yeah, if you just read through the left of mine, I, Four things I mentioned were timings, the quantitative and qualitative data collection. And I also talked about breaching of ethics, which you will talk about later on, and a massive bias. Okay, so if you look down on this one, I talked about a lot of, a lot of, yeah, omitted the younger population, and I talked about breaching ethics. Again, I fell in the trap of being purely negative. You can also say why well, it was good, and yeah. And make sure to explain why your methods are valid again evaluation is not always negative you can explain why your methods were justified okay although we did that a bit in the justification of methods you can just do a little small roundup in here as well and you can always explain why what made sorry you can always explain that you made necessary adjustments which helped improve the investigation which also shows better awareness of your methodology all right, so um, the next session I'd like you to mention will be about ethics of your data collection. So yeah, just pause the video here to have a look at my ethics. And yeah, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. So in this section, you'll need to think super sensitively, talk about how you will take steps to not offend anyone or harm businesses or nature if you're doing physical. 
And yeah, one the four things, three things I would highly consider is that you also mentioned that you you made sure data was anonymous, so you didn't ask any personal details, like age, birthday, blah blah, blah all that stuff. Just to make sure your data is anonymous, as there's a massive like data privacy protection and research papers, and yeah. And um, talk about your modifications to methods due to ethical considerations. So if you turn to the left here, if you look at the second paragraph, I talked about during the planning stages of investigation, I made many unethical questions, such as how much do you earn? And these were intrusive in nature, and I suggested that, um, yeah, you can't use that because it's just breaching of privacy. Another thing would be, sorry, uh, personal behavior. So obviously there's a massive thing about consent nowadays. Mention it. Talk, talk about how if someone rejected you for an interview, you did not pursue any further and you weren't aggressive at all. So yeah, just a read through all of this. And another big thing I would suggest is that to justify your ethical considerations, you have to reference research papers. So if you look at my um, whole paragraph, I referenced the UK law. So if you look at my cursors, I mentioned, um, yeah, all methods were within the legal framework set by the UK government. Okay, so I referenced the UK laws and I used a book on online ethics. So let me try to find that for you. So following the guide, if you look at the third paragraph, I had an online form and I said I followed this match guy 2007 so that all I followed all the data ethics online as well. Yeah, so essentially you just got to think how can you make this ethical, how can you be less intrusive and yeah, just talk about it and how you manage to make and keep up with ethical data collection or methodology. All right, so the next section is the risk assessment. Uh, so this is the less impressive version, which I which I think should be fine. But if you're aiming for top marks, I will show you a better version on the next slide. But all good research papers collecting primary data follow a risk assessment, and it's very simple. So number one, list out all possible events that could endanger you in a data collection. It could be small, like tripping, or more far-fetched, like someone stabbing you, or just high crime rates. And if you look there, uh, yeah, I listed out event number, second number one, falling, getting lost in an area, getting hit by cars, exposure to poor weather. Yeah. And the second step would be to assign a value of risk to the event. So you can literally just say number one, low, or medium, or high. Yeah, and etc. So you just have to say, oh, getting, getting hit by cars is a massive risk, so it's high. And then within each event, you need to write down a mitigation strategy. For example, Guessing, saying, um, let's say one of your events was getting stabbed, say that you were conducted data collection in well-lit areas or something along those lines to prevent crime. This is just very far-fetched examples, but if you look here, if if you look at event number one, I talked about falling, that, that could be low, medium, you assign it. I, I didn't put it here because I did it differently, but you can just say falling is a low risk. How will you uh, mitigate risk? So I've put one number one here, wear suitable footwear for long distance walking and keep head up at all times to scan area for tripping hazards. Yes, it sounds very stupid, but you just have to be very, be very meticulous about this stuff. And yeah, I would say you literally can get, you can copy all of this if you want, if you really wanted to, because I was struggling to find more than 10 events because it was just stupid. It just got, the risk just got stupid at that point. And I was just thinking of dumb stuff. So yeah, just think simply, talk about like maybe you the weather will be really hot, so you need to bring like a sun cream or something. It's just very simple and it's like a low risk. Just follow this. Now, sorry, if you really want to go overkill on the risk assessment, which I did, here's how I did it. So I defined risk and I think most research papers, they say risk is likelihood times severity. So number one, step one, when I've defined risk, and then I'd also define the two factors within risk. So that's the likelihood and severity. And if you look over here where my cursor is, um, let me zoom in. Yeah, so if you, I talk, I define likelihood, defined uh, severity, and then I talked about how I looked at the risk equation. And yeah, and you just need to mention it. And then you need to create a risk matrix. Now this is what gets you full marks. So risk matrix going from one to five in likelihood and severity. I mean, look at the right for the risk matrix. And I designed this through Microsoft Excel. I'm pretty sure you can do it as well if you really wanted to, but I designed this risk matrix, okay? I mean, I defined what one 
what likelihood of one means and what a like a likelihood of five means, which is variety certain and severity ranging from one to five. So now that you've defined risk and the factors within it, and you've made the risk matrix, I want you to assign numerical values. So like is the is the risk of falling one? What is the, I mean, is the, is the likelihood of falling one? Is the likelihood of, is the severity of falling two? Okay, so look, that's exactly what I did here. So I gave a numerical value for likelihood and then severity. I'm going to work out the risk. All right. I and mean, now that you worked out the risk, you can say stuff like, if risk exceeded 20, you, it should be called off or you decided not to do um, your investigation. You can just, this is just one line. And then same as the previous slide, you just want to talk about the mitigation strategies for events. So this one, this one seems a lot more professional. It looks a lot more complicating, uh, complicated, but I assure you when you have this little risk matrix on the side, if I was looking at research paper and I saw this, I'll know, I'd think this guy is crazy. He must be, he must be onto something. It just looks way more professional. And yeah, this is how I went over killing it. And make sure you label your tables, by the way. So here we have here, and then you just want to do this um, mitigation strategy thing again. And yeah, the reason why this is upgraded is this risk matrix thing, there's, it's just overkill. It's really, if you want to do it, do it. Because like, it is very good. But here's a key note. If you're short on time, do not attempt the upgraded version as methodology has little marks compared to analysis and valuation. The only reason why I was able to do it is because my I literally I had a lot of time on my hands afterwards because I, I did my NEA quite quite well in my opinion in terms of managing my time and I was able to do all these like cool things with my methodology. Alright so here are other things to consider. So that was basically the bulk of the methodology. As I said it was very simple. It's just very brain dead except the risk assessment maybe and ethics into things slightly more. But yeah talk about how you adapt to your methods, talk about why you chose the location to collect data and this is a quite niche thing. I'd say not many people did but if you say or just pretend you did a study prior to your actual study, you can call it a pilot study. So I made a whole paragraph about pilot studies. I'll zoom in here so you guys can read it. And essentially with the pilot study, what I did was I talked about why my initial study was flawed and why I chose the new location for my real study. So if you look at here, so within the method setting outside, uh, so during the pilot study, it was noticed that foot traffic on originally planned routes was particularly low. And that is why I chose my new roads. You can say stuff like that. It shows massive awareness over your over your um, NEA. And yeah, and it just really helps. It shows the examiner you've got massive awareness over yourself, which is a good thing. And yeah, that's the end of the video, but I have some news. So my bad for the delay in outputting video. I've been quite busy during my gap year. And yeah, so this is the second new news. The new business email for potential tuition, if you really want it, or general help, is jyleongbusiness at gmail.com. So if you do want to drop me a question and you don't want to have your, don't want to communicate via YouTube, I have my business email there and we can talk about your thing further or your problem further. And yeah, I'm unsure when I'll output the next NEA video, which will be on analysis and maybe data presentation. I should probably do a data presentation video since I haven't explained how to output your data. And yeah, I'll probably do it by the end of October. But in the meantime, if you have any topic ideas, just drop it down in the comments. And yeah, I'll probably do a how to revise video and data presentation video next. And yeah, that's the end of the video. Hope you guys do well. And yeah, I'll see you in the next one.